worsening cough and shortness of breath. He endorsed that maybe he had some low-grade fevers. And the thing that really bothered him and why he knew he was ill is that he really uh, didn't feel like smoking. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing. This is a, a thing that we see in the pulmonary clinics, which may be different from infectious disease clinics, is that patients, when they're attached to their cigarettes and they can't smoke, they, they seek attention. <laughs> On exam, his lungs were abnormal. He had an abnormal breast sound on the right side, and this is a, a chest x-ray, which shows you here the abnormality. Just for orientation, I don't know how many people are, how many physicians are in the audience? Just a couple. So, just for orientation, these are clavicles. These are ribs that go along here. This big white thing is the heart. This is part of the aorta. The lungs are black because they're full of air, and that's why they're black compared to some of these other organs which are white. Here's your stomach. It also has a little air in your stomach, usually, and that's called the stomach bubble. So these are normal lungs here. Down here is pretty normal, up here is pretty normal, and then the abnormality is, of course, circled, and that would be a pneumonia, relatively small pneumonia. He was given antibiotics by, in the emergency room for bacterial pneumonia, something similar to a Z pack. I can't remember exactly what he got, but uh, for bacterial pneumonia. He had blood work done in the emergency room. It was negative for the valley fever. And he called two weeks later because although initially he felt better, he now felt worse. And he had a repeat chest x ray. And you don't have to be a radiologist to see that this is much worse. It's a little denser, it's whiter. Uh, and so that was two weeks later. He had repeat blood work, and this is a thing that usually happens with valley fever, is that one test is not diagnostic. You need follow-up tests, you need serial examinations, and oftentimes very close follow-up to make sure that the disease does not progress and that it is getting better. His blood work now, that serology or those antibodies were positive for COXI. He was treated. And he did very well over four months, was followed with x-rays, repeat blood work. Uh, but he did have a residual nodule or spot on the lung, which because we know in this patient he had valley fever, we're pretty confident that this is due to valley fever. And in a later case, we'll come back to that, which sometimes is not that obvious. So where does this uh, gentleman fall? He falls on the, again, Pneumonia with symptoms, 30%. Unlike the last patient who completely resolved very quickly, this patient took longer to resolve, and actually worsened before it resolved, required therapy, and now has a residual scar or spot on the lung that will be followed to see if it goes away. Patient three, a 67-year-old male smoker, long-standing diabetes, so a chronic disease that affects your immune system, high blood pressure, had a heart attack, small heart attack three years prior, and a little bit of emphysema. Uh, he had, quote, bronchitis for several weeks, and for the past six weeks um, was treated with prednisone and a few different antibiotics for what would be considered emphysema and exacerbation of COPD and emphysema type treatment. And then came to the hospital very ill after almost two months, two to three months really, of not feeling well and getting uh, an inappropriate therapy. Came to the hospital very ill, and a CAT scan of the lung showed extensive pneumonia, which I'll show you here. This is a normal lung. Again, this is a CAT scan. CAT scan, unlike the x-ray, this CAT scan is a cut, kind of like we cut in half. You went to the magician instead of the physician. <laughs> this is what it would look like. So this is the trachea, or the windpipe. The lungs, which are black because they're full of air. This is the beginnings of the great vessels of the heart and a lot of um, subcutaneous tissue. These are, this is the spine. You can see this is markedly different. Really the only normal lung is up here in this section. All this is inflammation uh, due to pneumonia. So very extensive disease, much different than the last x-ray I showed you where it's just one tiny spot. This patient required intubation, was put on a ventilator, went to the intensive care unit, because there was no diagnosis secured, he had what is called a bronchoscopy. Many of you are probably familiar with an endoscopy or a colonoscopy, 
recommended for anyone over 50 for colon cancer screening. This is similar, but obviously very different, in which we take a scope and it goes into your lung. And we sample the inflammation, and we also send it off for cultures. So it's a good way for us to, to get at what's causing these pneumonias. It's not perfect, but it's a good procedure and it's very safe. I also use bronchoscopy in my research laboratory in order to help further the study of fungal diagnostics, just a little bit. But because the diagnosis was not secured and the, the blood work was positive, we had to have invasive testing. The lung wash did show toxicities or valley fever, the spherules that Dr. Gavinati showed you. And he was placed on intravenous antifungal therapy, but he got worse and died. And this sort of illustrates how bad disease can get bad and death can happen very quickly. So that even though it's 5%, if you're one of the 5%, it's uh, not good. Um, just, just to distinguish that from some people with pneumonia will also worsen. This is somebody who came in with fulminant disease. He also had a lumbar puncture, had uh, spherules and, and valley fever in his spine and his, around his brain. He also had it in his blood and it grew in his blood. So a very sick, very sick gentleman. And I don't want to end on a bad note, so we'll go back to a healthy patient. Patient number four, a healthy 60-year-old former smoker, concerned about lung cancer, and decides to go to the lung cancer screening clinic and pay out of pocket for a low-dose screening CT scan to look for lung cancers. It's recommended. Uh, very new recommendations that, and this will be important for physicians in the audience, but also for patients who may have smoked. There are recommendations, just like mammograms for breast cancer, pap smears, for cervical cancer, there are now recommendations coming out for low-dose CT scans for those who smoke and have risk factors uh, for lung cancer. So we're seeing a lot of these CAT scans in our clinic, uh, and the interpretation from this CAT scan was that there was a small lung nodule suspicious for lung cancer. That's not what you want to see under screening cancer study. And this is the nodule. It looks pretty benign enough. It's just a little spot on the lung. Again, this is the cross section. That's at the arrows is the uh, nodule. Doesn't look too scary. Nodules, as I showed you in patient two, are common. And if we have that story in which you have a pneumonia and it's getting better and you're left with a spot on the lung, then we're confident that that spot is due to a past infection. However, someone like this, who was maybe asymptomatic, had an exposure to valley fever, didn't seek medical attention. We don't know what this spot's due to. And he's a smoker, which always makes us concerned that lung cancer uh, could be a possibility. It's usually a benign course, obviously, in people with valley fever. These nodules or these spots may change shape or turn into cavities. <laughs> But they generally stay the same or resolve over one to five years. Oftentimes we have to follow with x-rays and, and examination. And again, unless it's related to coxie, it's very difficult to tell the issue of cancer. And when we went back and talked to this gentleman, there was no history of pneumonia or valley fever. The blood work for the, the serology was negative, or those antibodies to detect uh, whether or not they, he's been exposed to valley fever were negative. And so this ensued, a long discussion in my clinic ensues about what to do with these spots on the lung. And that usually center on risks and benefits of ignoring it, repeating CAT scans every six to 12 months to make sure they don't grow, biopsying them with a needle, or simply cutting them out and getting rid of them. And some of this depends on the patient, their philosophy of care, uh, maybe our discussions and how I steer them with complications. These are relatively safe procedures, but some of them are surgeries. So the patient wanted it removed, and it was a coxie nodule. And so even though he was happy because he knew he was a little, uh, had some buyer's remorse because he had some complications and was in the hospital for at least a week and had pain related to the surgery, and so had a little bit of a longer recovery period. But these are the decisions that are difficult that we face in the pulmonary clinic. So this is a gentleman, if you look at our pie chart, who really had no symptoms had a CAT scan for other reasons, looked like he had a residual of a, an infection, and indeed that's what he had, he did not have uh, a lung cancer. Good news. So just some conclusions. 
If a patient with coccidioidomycosis pneumonia is already improving, no antifungal therapy is indicated. These come from guidelines that Dr. Galgiani and myself have written, uh, but also uh, styles of care and, and things that we've seen over and over again. This is very much like patient one, who with a little bit of time got better. Therapy is indicated in those with persistent signs and symptoms of active pneumonia. This is very much like patient two, who came in, had a small pneumonia, got a little worse, needed treatment, got treatment, and now has a, a little nodule or scar. Most people do well with or without therapy, but people can have severe disease and can die of severe infection. This is especially true for people whose immune system is suppressed, as I showed you in patient three. Nodules are generally benign, do not require treatment, but we need to exclude lung cancer. When we have that very nice scenario where we know they've had an infection, great, but when we don't, sometimes we need to go to surgery to prove that this is not a cancer, especially in those with high risk. Bronchoscopy with biopsies or other procedures may be needed, and every time I see the word bronchoscopy, it reminds me of the research that we have ongoing uh, at the Valley Fever Center, and we're very interested in uh, diagnostics, how to diagnose valley fever more rapidly and hopefully get people treated more quickly than be treated. <laughs> so we have time for some questions, but I'd like to start actually um, Ken's comments about this problem of figuring out what a spot on the lung or a nodule is, is a really interesting sort of situation. That, that was uh, based on a national multi-site survey that the NIH funded, and they came out with some very uh, database uh, conclusions. One of the problems for us is that I don't believe a single one of the sites in that multi-site collaboration was in the endemic region for valley fever. Uh, it wasn't here, it wasn't Phoenix, it wasn't Bakersfield, um, the major places that see a lot of this. And now these recommendations are, are being promulgated nationally. The, the, it's a, it's a, you know, you're going to find a lot of things when you do high resolution CAT scans, right? Almost everyone, if you're my age, gets a CAT scan, you're going to find something. So there's a whole lot of having to figure out what to do. And the NIH study uh, showed a risk benefit to actually go do this. Um, and there's this idea of number needed to treat before you find something. And it's, uh, do you have it off the top of your head? With it? It's some small number. If you go after them, some percentage of the ones you find will indeed be a cancer. And if you take it out, you will cure the patient. But if you're in this part of the country where there's so many more people that have spots on their lungs because of other things besides cancer, specifically the alley fever, that number to need to treat might double, might even triple. And um, Dan, you know, uh, I'm thinking of recent discussions about what should the NIH do about, uh, about going forward with the study. Uh, and they announced the intention to do a study. And actually, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking that a very productive study might not be, or one, one approach that's been suggested is we should find out if treating those early pneumonias with, with antifungal drugs works. We actually don't know the answer to that yet. We make judges, judgments patient by patient. But another possibility would be to take on this questions of nodules in the lungs. You, you've been thinking about this too, uh, I wonder if you have any. We've, we've, had actually, we've actually had an additional discussion on the nodule discussion of could they take the current data sets and then do a certain amount of data in, you know, Phoenix, Maricopa, you know, um, you know Tucson, Pima, and bounce that off. Yeah, I'm still not sure what has the greatest, you know, value for us. It's it's a very, I mean, this is. I mean, what you're doing here is you're taking a lot of people that are feel okay, and you're screening them. So there's a, and now you're screening them with high resolution CAT scans, which is radiation and cost for the procedures. And then downstream, when you find stuff, more care is being done to figure out what you found. And many of those people didn't have cancer. So that's the issue: is 
how to best use those tools to help the most people. And it, and, and it would be fun to actually, whether retrospectively look into the data or maybe collecting more data in the populations of ours uh, where it comes up because it, it's, a, it's really spreading across uh, the, uh, the community in terms of the screening program. Do you have any thoughts about that? How many of these you've seen? And I think you summarized very well the, the problem, and that is um, people who are asymptomatic are getting scans that are going to show past infections, and then if they have an abnormality, they're either going to get aggressive care or we're going to follow them with more CAT scans, and that's that's problematic. Um, we see there's not a day that goes by that we don't have that discussion uh, with the patient about valley fever in general, and I'd say every week we talk about a nodule that either needs biopsy or, or uh, surgical removal. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big problem. The scope of it's pretty pretty large. Questions? Is a smoker's lung more susceptible to valley fever? That's a, that's a question for yeah. So the question was whether or not a smoker's lung is more susceptible to valley fever. And that's a really good question. I can tell you that there are certain types of valley fever that a smoker's lung is susceptible to. One is called chronic cavitary. It's not that common, but because the lung has some distorted architecture, uh, it's followed with CAT scans. Even if you're, even if that patient is, is is not wanting to do surgery, if it gets bigger, sometimes they change their mind, uh, and so it's our duty to sort of uh, have some fidelity to that process and allow people to make uh, important decisions, not just at one point in time, but over the course of follow-up. Sir, did you have a question? I did, uh, and it was related to the same thing she was talking about. In a case where you had substantial scarring in the lungs, uh, I had a lung motion, and I had I was in intensive care for quite a while, and so I had quite a bit of scarring. Uh, I'm currently still, and it's been over a period of the last couple of years, and I'm still uh, on fluconazole. You're saying that you probably wouldn't do that? Okay. Well, if you want a console, I'll have to see you. <laughs> but uh, in, in general, it's a very difficult decision as to when to stop therapy. It's easy to start from here and take your fluconazole. In those patients who don't get better, or who are very ill, or we don't know why they might have disseminated, it's difficult to stop. And sometimes that means years of therapy. And again, long discussions about the pros and cons of, of stopping therapy. Blood work is often needed to make sure that even if you have a little bit of valley fever still there, that it doesn't reactivate. So those are discussions that um, usually I have with my patients. Yeah. Um, can I can I follow up on that for sure. just a second? Uh, would that be exacerbated by the fact that a person has a uh, an immune system that's not really? I I have a rheumatoid arthritis, and so I'm taking medication for that. Yeah, so that, that's complicating things quite, quite significantly. If your immune system is suppressed, sometimes people require lifelong therapy. At scans, even if you're, even if that patient is, is, is not wanting to do surgery, if it gets bigger, sometimes they change their mind. Uh, and so it's our duty to sort of uh, have some fidelity to that process and allow people to make uh, important decisions, not just at one point in time, but over the course of follow-up. Sir, did you have a question? I did, uh, and it was related to the same thing she was talking about. In a case where you had substantial scarring in the lungs, uh, I had a lung motion, and I had, I was in intensive care for quite a while, and so I had quite a bit of scarring. Uh, I'm currently still, and it's been over a period of the last couple of years, and I'm still uh, on fluconazole. You're saying that you probably wouldn't do that? Okay. Well, if you want a console, I'll have to see you. <laughs> but uh, in, in general, it's a very difficult decision as to when to stop therapy. It's easy to start from here and take your fluconazole. In those patients who don't get better, or who were very ill, or we don't know why they might have disseminated, it's difficult to stop. And Sometimes that means years of therapy, and again, long discussions about the pros and cons of, of stopping therapy. Blood work is often needed to make sure that 
even if you have a little bit of valley fever still there that doesn't reactivate. So those are discussions that um, usually I have with my patients. Yeah. Um, can I can I follow up on that for sure. just a second? Uh, would that be exacerbated by the fact that a person has a uh, an immune system that's not really? I I have a rheumatoid arthritis, so I'm taking medication for that. Yeah, so that, that's complicating things quite, quite significantly. If your immune system is suppressed, sometimes people require lifelong therapy. That doesn't mean all the time. It means that you have to make sure that you have to follow the blood work, uh, follow maybe imaging, uh, and especially if you're on therapy and it was stopped and you're thinking about restarting it again, uh, sometimes people will leave you on therapy. This is a little bit style of care, not a lot of evidence right now. As to how to handle those, but Dr. Galliani can weigh in. And not to monopolize, uh, but one more follow-up question. Sure. In your opinion, uh, the, with extensive uh, scarring or nodules, whatever, in the lungs, would that necessarily affect your vital capacity? It would. It, it can. Um, on breathing tests. Yeah. For example. Yes, it can. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes, I would like to tell you that back, I can share in July. Those three things. How do we educate our friends and neighbors? Um, for the, number two, how do we educate the medical community? Uh, my wife runs a big surgery center, and we've had conversations with her docs, and it's fascinating how many they think they know something about it, and a lot of what they seem to know is also wrapped in folklore. But our probably our biggest project is being able to help. Um, Dr. Galgiani and some of the others out there with the CDC, with the folks in Atlanta, with a lot of the federal medical research bureaucracy, to actually get them to pay attention to something that's going on to us out here in the West. Uh, you know, how do we get the compounds? How do we get it in priority? How do we find money to, you know, find a better test? Um, I think we've had, and I gotta tell you, I think we've had more progress in the last six months than we probably had in the previous few years. Um, so please, if you have an email list, if you have those things, share, as you collect the information, share um, it. It's probably the smartest thing we can do to sort of help our friends and neighbors. So, you know, it goes on. Thank you, David. Appreciate the comment. So let's resume. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my very good friend Lisa Schubitz, a veterinarian um, who's worked with uh, both experimental mice, uh, mouse models of valley fever for many, many years now as part of the Valley Fever Vaccine Project and other activities, and also is a practicing veterinarian who has, you know, clinical experience with this disease. Um, and her topic is the pet connection, valley fever in animals. Lisa. Thank you. Um, I'm fortunate to working with Dr. Galdiani and uh, found a niche in valley fever that I actually didn't know very much about before I worked with him, in spite of the fact that I grew up in Arizona. So this is Jackson. Jackson came to me last January or so, having failed treatment with mucosal for a respiratory valley fever infection. And Three drugs later, under my care, oral drugs, he still was not getting better from the valley fever. And we went with um, an injectable valley fever medication. We were down to scraping the bottom of the barrel of valley fever medication. And here he is in the hospital getting amphotericin B, which is the last thing that we really realistically had to give this dog. And uh, the New York Times showed up and wanted to do an article on valley fever in animals, and so Jackson's kind of famous. He's, he's one of the faces of valley fever that's helped raise awareness of this disease in animals and humans. And um, he did actually go on to get well, which is good, the good news. But it shows that this is a really big problem in animals. So humans and dogs are really constitute the vast majority of cases of valley fever in, in, in mammals. 
which is where valley fever shows up. We don't see this disease in birds. But we also see valley fever in llamas and alpacas. The South American camellas are exquisitely sensitive to the disease. Economically, they're not extremely important because we just don't have that many of them out here. If you're an alpaca llama or an alpaca breeder, it's kind of important to you. We see occasional cases in cats and horses. We see about one case in cat for every 50 cases in dogs. And when they come in, they're extremely ill. So we'll actually see some pictures of disease in cats. Horses don't really cross my office door. Um, and horses, obviously, they get infected and they mostly clear infection. Um, but occasionally, they be, they're physically impacted by this disease. Non-human primates are very susceptible. These animals are primarily limited to zoos, so this has a big impact on zoos. And there's other exotics, also include zoo animals. Marine mammals are another animal to get infected with it. And uh, so obviously this spores are blowing out over the ocean. It's been found in sea lions, dolphins, and sea otters. Well, this guy, this is our local polar bear, or Tucson Zoo. So, the vast majority of all the infections that animals get are breathed in. Very rarely an infection can be acquired by direct injection, meaning uh, perhaps they uh, got a spore into a wound or something like that. But generally speaking, the spores enter the animal body because they breathe them in. And it, regardless of where they end up, in a bone or in the eye or the brain, they usually enter by way of the lungs. This is true of humans as well. You've probably already heard that though. So, and as in humans, the primary disease that dogs get, um, dogs, okay, so, let me back for just one second. The, the, the most of the rest of this talk is gonna focus on dogs. As I told you, um, most of the cases are in dogs, the most economically important species. And we'll see a little bit about kitty cats. Uh, because the other sort of pet animal that is um, relevant from a veterinary medicine standpoint, small animal practice. But economically speaking, the dog is most similar to the human and has it has the greatest economic impact on dogs. So primary pulmonary disease is really common in the dog. And they present with this with some or all of these symptoms, coughing, fever, lack of energy, lack of appetite, weight loss. They're actually pretty similar to what people get. And not all the signs are always present. They may present with only some of these signs. And then for cats, this is not the typical presentation. Only about 25% of cats are taken to the vet and diagnosed with valley fever because they have respiratory signs. By the time a cat goes to the vet for valley fever, it's usually gone someplace other than the lungs, and they're taken to the vet for another reason. <coughs> so this is what valley fever pneumonia looks like in dogs. This is a sort of run-of-the-mill valley fever pneumonia. And you don't have to worry about this. This is infiltrates in the lung infiltrates in the lung, infiltrates in the middle of the lung. Lots of pictures, I didn't want to bore you with too many details. So belly fever can get worse in the lungs and not respond, kind of like the picture of Jackson that ended up in the, with the Amphoterus and Bee and in the New York Times. So this is a dog where it's, there's fluid around the lungs and the dog was taken to the hospital because it was having a lot of trouble breathing, the respiratory rate was rapid, um, and you can't see the heart in this dog because the fluid's going around the lungs. This is a dog with very, very, very severe valley fever pneumonia. Um, they're almost all white everywhere. So this is what we call progressive lung disease. It involves most of the lung or thoracic cavity so this outside the lungs of the thoracic cavity. And generally speaking, 
these dogs are responding poorly to our typical oral medication. These are the kinds of cases that end up coming to see me in most, most of the time, because I do consultations on valley fever cases only. So this is the kind of stuff that comes through my door. Typically, these are handled very easily in an ordinary, regular, this is the kind of case that, every, you know, one of these walks in the door of a veterinary practice every single week in Tucson, Phoenix, and Casper. That's how much dog valley fever there is up here. So disseminated disease is what we get when the valley fever leaves the lungs and goes someplace else in the body, gets outside the lungs. <coughs> this may occur without any previous history that the owner has noticed of a respiratory infection. The dog may not have coughed, it may not have had a fever, it may have skipped all of those signs on the slide that I showed you three slides back. This is not very uncommon. It's, it's, we see it a lot. The symptoms are related to the organs infected, so they can be highly variable. But in dogs, the most common thing is lameness. This disease has a predilection for the bones in dogs. And where valley fever disseminates to most commonly is variable by the kind of animal infected. Okay? And these animals, they may or may not have a fever or any other signs of valley fever. They may have some lung disease or, or they may not have some lung disease. Most commonly, these dogs just have disease in a pitiful and they don't have it in their lungs anymore. It's come and gone in the lungs. In cats, the most common place for this disseminated disease to show up is in their skin. They have non-healing skin leaves. And often they've been to the vet two, three, four times. They've been on antibiotics. And the lesions don't get better. And eventually the vet biopsies the lesions and the valley fever is diagnosed by biopsying the skin lesions. So this is why only 25% of those cats have lung diseases is the present with this disseminated form, not even skin leaf. <laughs> Other things, they may have generalized weight loss. This is common in cats. Um, seizures, if this disease goes to the brain. Um, it has a bit of a predilection for testicles in the dog. Though, what, 80 or 90% of our dogs are neutered. Um, but if you have intact animals, this, is, this can be a problem. Um, painful eyes and blindness, it can go to the eyes in the dog and make them blind. Draining tracts, again, it can be in the skin and it can cause oozing lesions. Um, subcutaneous swellings, which can go along with these draining tracts. And um, the dot, dot, dot is because we can be here all day making a list. It can go almost anywhere. And veterinarians have a pretty high awareness of this, so it's kind of always on the list of possibilities of weird things in Arizona. This is what disseminated disease looks like in the bones. This is a normal bone. Everything's nice and smooth, white on the edges, a little bit gray on the inside. This very rough, swollen-looking mess right here is a valley fever bone lesion in a dog. Uh, this is the knee joint and the back leg of a dog. This is a kitty cat. We don't see tons of bone lesions in cats, but this just happens to be a cat with a bone lesion. Uh, probably a very long standing bone lesion. Uh, this is the elbow joint. And again, um, we've got some smooth bone up here, and this is a very rough, this is called a proliferative bone lesion. It's making a lot of bone here on the edges. Valley fever does this really well. And this is a very sore, lame kitty cat. One of the reasons cats get presented to the vet very late is they have a tendency to sort of go into the bed and hide and not tell you they're sick. So they kind of um, don't let you know they're ill. Dogs will just run around the backyard and carry your leg and you know that they're lame. This is a cat. I told you cats don't get very much valley fever, but it's really dramatic when they do. So I have really amazing pictures of cats with bad valley fever. This is underneath the tongue of a cat. This would be essentially um, 
a, a subcutaneous non healing lesion, even though it's inside the mouth of a cat. And this is another one right next to it. This is the upper gum of a cat. This is the pad of a foot. And this is right behind the shoulder blade. This is all the same cat. Basically, everywhere we put a needle in this cat, he had valley fever, including places like his liver and his spleen. And he lived about two years with amphotericin B, intraconazole, you name it, he got it. And eventually his kidneys gave out from all the drugs and he died of renal failure. This is another cat. And this is a giant belly fever mass in the front of uh, his chest. This is his heart, this is his lungs. Um, and this is pressing on his airway, and the cat was presented on emergency because it was having a very difficult time breathing. This is a dog, two-year-old dog that came in with cluster seizures, again on emergency. And this white lesion right here is a valley fever lesion. These come on very acutely, and there's usually a lot of swelling around them, so these dogs um, are usually seizuring really badly and um, they, they often come in on emergency and usually with no prior history of seizures. We'll talk a little bit about diagnosis, just a key factor for you. So when it comes to diagnostics, it's not always completely straightforward and um, there's usually a battery of tests that need to be run and it usually batters your checkbook for you. So there's usually some blood tests that need to be run, some generalized blood tests, and the vet learns things from this. So they run serum chemistries and complete blood counts. Often these dogs will have elevated white blood cell counts, which are an indication of infection. And they have increased globulin protein, which is a fraction that's associated with the animal making a lot of antibody. The antibody doesn't really help to fight the infection. It's just an indicator that the animal is trying really hard to fight the infection. Cats are a real secret about this. Their blood changes are not helpful in diagnosing this infection. Imaging, I've shown you lots of pictures of imaging and how helpful that can be in diagnosing this infection. So x-rays are really useful for looking at lungs and bones. I think they're extremely important because they give the veterinarian something to monitor besides these relatively vague things that are going on up here. CT and MRI, um, they're critical if you need to look inside of the central nervous system like the brain or the spinal cord. Um, occasionally they're used to look at lungs. It's much more common in humans because this is kind of a high dollar test for looking at thoracic cavity in animals because they have to be anesthetized to do it. <coughs> Ultrasound can be useful if you have to look at abdominal organs or take samples out of them um, or if you need to collect samples or look at lymph nodes inside of the thoracic cavity. <coughs> Valley fever serology test, this is a blood test, it's non-invasive, it's kind of the backbone of valley fever diagnosis in a definitive sort of way. If your animal has valley fever antibodies, test for antibodies, along with lungs that look like valley fever and an elevated white blood cell count with some globulins, that pretty much leads you very strongly in the direction of making a diagnosis of valley fever. So this is a pretty important test that we use a lot of in veterinary medicine. Um, people talk a lot about titers. Veter veterinarian will talk a lot about titers. If the test is positive, they use the titer often to try to tell you how sick your dog is and if your dog is getting better, if the titer is getting lower, and things like that. Other things they call this are a COXI test, a COXI serology, or a valley fever blood test. And then other laboratory tests that are a little more, um, they require some collection of samples. Cytology and histopathology, these are things that require that um, a needle be used to collect um, fluid from a, you know, from a drain lesion perhaps. Histopathology, something may need to be cut out like those draining lesions on, those skin lesions on the kitty cat. 
So these are samples that are collected from the patient. So this is a little more invasive. And they're sent to the laboratory for examination and they look under the microscope to see if there are valley fever organisms in tissue. This is, this is more definitive. Okay, if they see these organisms in the tissue, um, they can say with quite, quite good certainty that the animal has valley fever. And then finally, fungal culture. If they collect these kinds of samples, tissue samples or fluid samples, and send it to the laboratory and they grow the fungus and identify it, and it was in your animal, that's a very definitive test that says your animal has valley fever. And then things like, you know, negative blood tests and whatever don't really make any difference anymore. It's pretty well negated by the finding of this. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about treatment. So I showed you a picture of this dog with um, fluid around the lungs, and this animal did in fact go on to get better and resume its active life. So treatments that we use, um, these three drugs are oral drugs, and this one, fluconazole, has been the most commonly used drug for the last, uh, well, the last 10 years for sure. <clears throat> 